I suppose I'm going to talk about stuff that uh, is slightly uh, different to what you've heard for the majority of the day. They've all been talking about equipment, technology, and uh, programming, and so on and so forth. Um, and I thought I'd, uh, I'd talk about a subject which I think is, is equally as important, and that's the reason why we're doing all this. Um, so it's really to focus on, actually, at the end of the day, what's all this about? It's, uh, it's actually to develop products that appeal to consumers and customers, and so it's important to get that bit right, too. Yes, as one of the previous speakers said, you need good engineers to execute a design, otherwise it's nothing. But at the same time, you've got to get the design specification right, otherwise it's pointless and people won't buy it. So um, just a bit of background explanation. Uh, Small Fry has been in business for, it says 30 years, but it's actually 40 years. Originally founded in 1971. Um, obviously, I, you, you can tell I've not been there since the beginning, obviously. <laughs> Um, but, um, you know, talking about digital, what's a photograph, what's a not, there's only one photograph on there, um, and that's this object here. So, yeah, it's, it's just sort of, it's, it's the stock in trade of what we do, digital imaging. It's all part of the persuasion uh, and marketing of your ideas to sell them into people. Um, I'm particularly proud to be here, um, and our offices is not very far from this location, probably two or three miles away, and there's a very good reason for that. Um, our pedigree and heritage is steeped deeply in the automotive and transportation um, market. And you probably all registered, if you stayed overnight, at the Roots Building, or you've, you've heard of the Roots Building. It's actually named after Chrysler Roots, or it was originally the Roots Brothers. Um, and the two founding partners of Small Fry were Anthony Smallhorn and Tim Fry. So I guess it could have been slightly worse if Smallhorn had gone out on his own. And I'd be standing here telling you I was from a small horn company. But anyway, um, that's the reason we have a stupid name. Um, and it's quite memorable. And people tend to, uh, well, we've been advised to keep it now. It's got some, obviously, legacy there. And uh, it's a reputation. Tim Fry designed the Hillman Imp when he was in his 20s. So that's, you know, by my standards, I wouldn't even have completed my degree. Um, there were lots of things about it that were good. There were lots of things about it that were bad. Um, but at the time, it was kind of at the pinnacle when we were doing really well in the automotive industry. And around us here, we had car production and many brands, Triumph Standard. I remember all the factories around here from because I'm from this part of the world. Um, and I'm pleased to say that. And, and, you know, on here, these are some of the things we used to do. Uh, there's a complete redesign of the Mass Ferguson tractor range. There's a, a full-size prototype fire engine we built. There's the full-size clay model of a van over there. There's a 252-seater high-speed catamaran operates out of Ocean Terminal in Hong Kong, uh, which Paul would no doubt have seen in, on his travels out there. Um, but nowadays, we're less involved in that specific sector and more generally involved in industrial design, product development, and the strategy behind it. Um, and, and that's very important. It's all to do with this business of getting the brief right and pitching the product correctly. But I am pleased to say the good news is that manufacturing is back on the agenda, allegedly. According to the government, we can't rely on the bankers to get us out of trouble. Um, so, say again? No, you can't rely on the government either. No, you can't believe a word they say either. Um, but a bit of background to me, um, what got me here. Um, basically, um, nowadays, I'm a regional director of an organization called the BDI, which is British Design Innovation. Um, we're a collection of industrial design companies that like to think we represent the lead thinkers in strategic design thinking. Um, it's a lot more than drawing pictures and colouring it in. Um, it's a, it's a, you know, associating what you do with strong marketing messages. I'm a board director of uh, Medilink West Midlands, and that primarily, when it was formed, was set up to help a lot of the manufacturers locally, first tier, second tier suppliers, of the automotive and transportation industry migrate across into the medical device world because a lot of the processes and the techniques that they'd perfected over the years, are, they transition well into the medical device market. And so there was help and support there through this organization to do that. I've also been an ambassador for Asia UKTI um, with my kind of just global hat on. I've represented the key strengths of the creative industries of the UK, not just flogging the capability of small fry, but representing the creative talent that we have generally got uh, in the UK. And we are well respected for our creative thinking uh, and our innovation techniques. And having taught out in the Far East, you know, I can tell you that because of the culture, it is difficult for them to get away from the, men the mentality of copying um, and to actually step out and think independently and freely but let's not get complacent, they will get there. 
In fact, I think there's probably now today 3,000, 4,000 Chinese students going to this university alone. So they are getting educated and trained on how to do it. They will come and get your breakfast and eat it for you. So I am also a member of the China Design Task Force, and I've spent many a, an hour and, well, an evening out there, you know, peddling our wares and, and basically trying to understand the role we can play out there. Um, but obviously you've heard from, from Paul what, what's going on in China with him. Um, so background, yeah, married, one daughter, nearly divorced because of my passion for the job. I love it, or as I should say, them, um, but you know, I'm, I'm very committed and I believe very much in this. I've been fortunate that um, in the past I've poo-pooed awards and things. I've, to be honest, um, I keep it no secret, I didn't like a lot of the heads of the, of the uh, community that I was in when I first joined the design profession. I felt it was led by a bunch of pompous, bow-tied people who were self-proclaimed style um, police. And frankly, that didn't do well with me. Um, I was more interested in doing the stuff that the title actually suggests. I'm an industrial designer and I work with industry and I help them make money, which if you know, that's a dirty concept, then you know, fine, but I'm quite comfortable with it. Um, I understand the need for these businesses to generate a profit. There's a word designers used to be almost unable to say. Um, but Nowadays, I do, I will go in for awards, and I'm particularly proud of the ones that we get for commercial performance, the return on investment. And I think we've got to educate ourselves and learn to speak the language of the, the boardroom. Otherwise, you know, we're never going to get recognised for the kind of impact we can significantly make on a business's performance. So, you know, there's an example of some of the people that we work for. And, you know, I'll be honest, they're all the kind of names I hope at least you might recognise one of, um, maybe two. But we do work for a lot of small independents, entrepreneurs. Fred in a shed has come up with a good idea. And we help nurture these people and get through to the market and make a success of it. And that's fundamentally one of the projects I'll, I'll sort of talk about in this presentation. So if you ask me to tell you, in a nutshell, my Lyft introduction, what do I do? Well, basically, the company it takes good ideas, either that we've generated or help, help the company generate. And we turn them into great products and service. That's it. Um, and I'll say it again. It's not about the technology. Silence in the room. But it isn't about technology. Actually, when you're dealing with consumer products, consumers don't give a crap about the technology, actually. Not unless you've got the real geeks, the early adopters. They only want what it enables them to do. And in, in, in an innovation sense, technology or innovation is there to either help you do something better then you can do it today or enable you to do something that you couldn't do today and do it tomorrow. Okay, and so we have to, we, we, we use a process called emotional logic. Uh, I'm not going to go too deeply into that, but I'll explain some of it. Um, <clears throat> but as Paul said in his slide, it's all about me. That's exactly how consumers think. But think about it, you're all consumers. And actually the truth is, when you're thinking about a decision to buy something, own something, acquire something, first and foremost, it's about me. You know, whether you're buying it for yourself or whether you're buying it for work, you've got the decision to make. You know, what value am I going to get about, out of it? What's it going to do for me? Am I going to get fired if I buy the wrong software? Then it's about me and my world, me and my daughter, me and my family, me and my kids, me and my job and my position, me and my stuff below me. And then it's about me, my world, the world. And what happens in a recession, the thinking gets, you know, and budgets get tighter, it goes back down to me. So it is very much about me. That's how we think. So all you've got to do is understand people and how they think then. And so what are the challenges behind that? Well, the thing about people is they're not aware of what they actually do. So can you just straight out go ask them? Um, because they don't behave as they or we think they do. Um, and they don't know what they'll want next until they're shown it. So if you're going to sit down and organise a focus group and find out what people want for the future, best to look with that one. Because they're going to tell you, all they're going to tell you is they, what they know today. You know, they don't possess the power of vision and foresight that a lot of creative people do. After all, that's what we've been trained to do. And actually, probably when we were best at this is when we were children. Because when you were a child, you know, a blanket over a table becomes a den, becomes a palace, becomes anything you want. 
But way back then, anything was possible. But then real world catches up with you. You go to university and they tell you all the things you can't achieve and the reasons why you can't. So you don't ever challenge it again. But actually, if you go back and challenge those things and ask the stupid questions from time to time, sometimes you think, well, hang on, no, that's not quite right. So remember that products are only a temporary solution to a problem. And the world moves on and technology moves on. And if Polaroid and Kodak had woken up to that earlier, they might not be in the position they're in today. So when you say, well, we do market research, be very careful. Because there are types of market research, like focus groups, like questionnaires and surveys, that will get you in, in information. But they're only really good for incremental evolution. If you want to find the opportunities for breakthrough, you've got to use other stuff. And you're much better off using things like ethnography. What's that mean? Well, basically, that just means observing people within the context and the environment of where they use the product or service. You know, don't take them out into an alien world. You know, gather together in some suburb around a table, give them 25 quid and a Mars bar to turn up and expect them to open up their heart and tell you the truth about what they think. Because they sat there thinking, oh, she's fit. I don't want to look like an umpty. And the, and the answers I'm going to give. So they're not going to do it. You're going to, you've got to control the circumstances. Or you can use other user-centered design research tools. It's a question of knowing what you're after. But be careful in assuming you know how to do it. You see, the problem is that we've got two sides to our brains, all of us. On the one side, we're very rational. And we're very comfortable with that. And it's all about the functional stuff. And so what happens is the technical people, generally, will write a specification and say, this is perfect, this is what you want. I know this, this is the rules, because this is the best. And therefore, no one can doubt it or question it. But actually, that's not true, because that's not what drives us. Because the other half of us is the emotional side of things. We get upset and we feel about things. and We get all sensitive. Um, and, and those are about things like buying motives, being irrational and emotive and instinctive and image-driven. And, you know, what's it going to do for me personally? How will I appear? What, you know, it's, it's got messages, subliminal stuff behind it when you make these purchases. It's about service-centred. That's what it's doing for you, and not only functionally, but emotionally. So in the West, it might not feel like it, but, you know, nowadays, basically, we've largely got most of the stuff we need, OK? And we've gone, we're in a recession. I think we might be on the way out of it, fingers crossed. But the point is, even then in the hard times, we've got the fundamentals of heating, light, safety, security, food, and stuff like that. So most of what we're looking for nowadays is emotional stuff. And in order to address customers, it gets quite hard because we're more different these days. We don't necessarily conform. It's, it's difficult to shoehorn us into segments like the marketing people like to do to, pre to, to present personas and profiles of what we do. Their expectations, our expectations, we are the customers. You know, they're sky high nowadays. We won't accept crap. And, and we've, we will complain, you know, vehemently. And our loyalty is very rare. We'll get on the internet, we'll see stuff in shops, we'll go see if we can find it cheaper at home. We'll chop and change readily to get a bargain or satisfy our needs and requirements. So you've got to work very hard to understand what's driving people. So the key to this is getting yourself into the mindset of seeing the world the way the customers and the consumers see it. So when somebody says to me, oh, which nice design concepts, which one would you choose? Irrelevant. Unless I represent the total market that I'm selling to, it's, it's pointless. And by the way, Mr. Chairman, your opinion doesn't count either, because you may not be in the right demographic for the people we're going to try and sell this to. Yeah? So you've got to get it positioned to, to hit the target of the people. So you have to become a chameleon as, as a designer and enter the world of the people that, and, and the experiences they're seeking and what they're looking for. <clears throat> so how many of you got a wristwatch on here? Can I just show of hands who's got a watch on? OK. How many of you actually bought it just to tell the time? Oh, I don't believe you. <laughs> Sorry, I don't. You know, people buy this stuff, but they don't buy it to tell the time. OK? This is doing something else for them. Quite what some of these watches is it's doing for those people, I don't know. But that's not for me to question. Um, but you have to understand what they're getting from this purchase and what that personal statement is. I mean, I know there's somebody else in the room with good taste because I spotted it on his wrist. He's got the same thing. Mark's got it on. In brass now, Mark, or what? 
Um, but one of the things I'd say is you just therefore can never assume that you know what's best for your audience. That's, that's a terrible mistake to make. You know, you can't be judge and jury. How serious does this get? Well, according to the World Health Organization, yeah, less than half the population, even in developed worlds, take life-saving medicine as they should. It doesn't get more serious than that, does it? Your life's on the line. Don't believe me? Then these are the statistics. This is month along the bottom, and that is percentage of compliance with people taking their medical prescription as they should do. You're down here at 20% after three months on stuff which is life-threatening because people don't like some of the side effects, they don't like the intrusion in their life, they don't like what it's doing for them, it's not convenient. There's a whole host of reasons, but whatever they are, Two years later, the compliance taking that medicine is costing the NHS a fortune, but they're not doing it. But they should. But how many of us drink and shouldn't? I know that some people, I saw them in the bar last night, they were way past what they should have had. We shouldn't speed, but we do. And there are certain drugs we shouldn't take, but we do. It's these that we can't get them to take. <clears throat> So in order to get to, this, to the truth of this, you've got to be able to understand your customers at an emotional level. So this is all about having empathy, not sympathy. You don't have to be the same as them. You just got to understand what drives them. Okay, so tickling your pleasure zones. What do we get off on? Well, actually, there's a couple of guys called Tiger and Jordan, and they spent time studying this. I'm not quite sure what techniques they went into, but they de decided there were four types of pleasure or as I termed them, pleasure zones. And they are basically physio pleasure. Think about it. You know, pleasure you get from stimulating sensory organs. You'll be pleased there's no pictures to support this. I'll let your imagination do the work. Then there's socio pleasure. There's the pleasure you derive from mixing with your peer group, with your friends, and going out, and it's just enjoyable, and the things you do. Yeah, it's all part of our emotional side of things. Then you've got psycho pleasure. You know, you decide, I'm going to run a half marathon, I'm going to run a whole marathon, whatever it is. But you set yourself a task, it's your goal, only you are driving you, you want to get a degree, you want to get a master, whatever it is. It doesn't matter, it's your goal. Those things drive people. And then finally, ideo pleasure. And that's the kind of derived from things like reading a book. That's your interpretation of what happened, or watching a film. But just by way of example, how many times have you read a book and then seen the film and thought, that's not how I interpreted it. That all goes on in your own little head, and that's fine. But that's your own personal set of values and so on that you're bringing to play there. So that's all about the ways that we can stimulate our senses. So what we use in our profession is creativity, and the tools are there as an enabler to allow us to do it. So when we're trading pixels and models, as one of the guys said, it's all to a purpose. Okay, and you've got to not lose sight of what that purpose is. So the inspiration for kind of small fries process to, to, to organize these ducks in a row came basically from the fact that it doesn't, you know, it doesn't take a genius to spot a wrong answer. But you need to really engage your brain to spot the wrong questions. Now how this came about is we've got a seven stage process. The first four stages of that are all focused on what we call mindset changing NPD, new product development. And the last three are technical NPD, new product development. And the point about it is that actually, if you treat a brief that's given to us or we work with, with a client as, as a, a question, and then you busily develop a solution to that, that's the answer. In days gone by, we would busily work away developing an answer to a question and then the product's launched and it failed in the market. Whose fault is it? Designers, obviously. They're stupid. They did the wrong thing. Well, actually, we went, hang on a minute. No, we did exactly what you told us to do. But what you told us to do isn't what the audience wanted. So there's a disconnect. So rather than whinge and bleat about it, we've set about analysing what's gone wrong and we've put a process in place to address it. So we look at market context what's happening in the wider world. Many of our, consumers have got a very, our customers have got a very myopic view of the world. They only see the competition as people like them. 
They never look at t technologies and have a broad scope of what's, you know, 360 what's around you. The things can come from behind and take them out of the game. They're not even aware of it. Then there's the strategic focus about where your business is, your brand is, how it sits against your competition. Are you happy there or do you have ambition to grow and move? If so, what are you going to do? So you have to look at your range then to see what you're making, to see what you keep, what you drop, where you can improve it. And what's the opportunity for delivering new? Where are the big wins to be had? And then you go opportunity prospecting, looking for those big wings, digging for the nuggets, the next big idea. And frankly, then you move into the technical execution, you buy all the tools and equipment, and you deliver the right solution to the right question. So let me give you an example of this. Um, somebody came to us, it, it's not a Fred in a shed, she's far more attractive than that, and she was very uh, clear about what her brand was about. She was basically, Jane Scrivener uh, did a range of muds and uh, waxes and oils and treatments for um, spa experiences, and she was very good at it. Um, but she had certain concerns about the way that the service is delivered at the point of consumption. Um, and she spent a long time getting the interior of her place right and the branding of her products correct. And she felt it was being let down. So, you know, thinking about it is not the same as doing it. We have to go out there and experience it for ourselves. Now, I need to point out at this point, I was not enjoying it. It was purely research. Having girly stuff stuck on my face is clearly not what I like to do. Okay, it was pretty good, really. Um, but, you know, there's the experience, there's the environment, there's the, all the sensory perceptions, there's music, there's mood lighting, there's, there's smell. You know, everything you can do to enhance that experience. And then there's the reality of how she was achieving it. She was sticking these waxes in the towel heater or getting bags of ice from the local supermarket for the stones, lobbing it in this ice bucket, or heating up the other stones in a water heater that looked like a bucket. And, and that's the kind of, under the swan, the legs are going like mad, and that's, the, that's what it was like. And she wanted to do something about it. So we kind of analysed the whole customer journey, yeah, to see it through the eyes of the consumer and to experience it. It's, it's ethnographic stuff, really. But, you know, I've got a team of my, my team are in here photographing and filming this, so it's not quite as tranquil and relaxed as it looks. You know, you've got to get naked and you're quite vulnerable then, you know. Obviously, the photographs that go back to the studio are not these ones. Um, and and you've, got to, you've got to get yourself in that position of vulnerability. And, and not, a lot of people are not comfortable with it. And you're trying to do all you can to improve things. So, yeah, the CAD's great. That was the proposition. Yeah, it, it looks gorgeous. She fell in love with the idea. What we've got here is a device that is packed with technology. It can take those waxes, and it, we, within 15 minutes on the base station, it takes them to 80 degrees. You can walk away with it, and it stays at 80 degrees for an hour with no power, no batteries, using phase change material. It was true to the brand. It fitted in well. It enhanced the experience, but it's crammed full of stuff to make it work. But to be honest, when you're lying on that bed, naked with a towel on you, you don't give a crap what's making it happen. You just know that the, the beautician isn't dodging off every 10 minutes to go and put the thing back in the towel oven to heat it up again. So you've, you know, you've maintained the myth. You've carried the experience on. So <clears throat> in summary, you've got to be careful. You know, what people say and what they do are very different. Um, we're generally more emotional than logical. So stop assuming you can dictate and it's all based on fact and performance. You need to determine the priority of needs, wants, and do of the consumer and customer you're appealing to. And at the end of the day, you have to remember with them, what's in it for me? 